John Mutter is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Shelf Awareness. He has over 30 years of experience in the publishing industry. He was a longtime executive editor of bookselling at Publishers Weekly and executive editor of the former PW Daily for Booksellers. Please welcome John Mutter. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Can you hear me OK? Uh, um, and thank you, PSU and Uligan Press, for inviting me here and dragging me out of a cold winter in uh, the Northeast. When I, when I left home uh, and drove to the airport on Thursday, the temperature gauge on the car was about 16 degrees. So it's really nice to be in Portland, uh, <laughs> be able to walk around in the sun without a scarf and gloves and a hat on. And I, I love Portland. I mean, it, you have Powell's Books, which is one of the best bookstores in the country, and that alone is uh, pretty amazing. So uh, first I want to add a little bit about myself and my background um, and shelf awareness so you understand my perspective on the book business. Um, I did, as Melanie said, I worked uh, more than 20 years at Publishers Weekly. I was uh, started as an assistant edit, a news editor, then became associate news editor, covering publishing news. Then I was a paperback uh, book review editor, and for the last half of my time I covered book selling as executive editor for book selling. Um, in the late 90s, we started up the, the daily email new newsletter called PW Daily for Booksellers, which was one of the first email newsletters in the industry. Um, the idea was to give booksellers the information they needed to do their jobs better and included all kinds of information about new books coming out, uh, author media appearances, news about bookstores, and more. And for those of you who know Shelf Awareness already, it might sound a little familiar. Um, in 2005, PW was hurting financially the way most magazines were, uh, and the powers that be decided to, to shift direction to try uh, more of a consumer orientation. And it, uh, kind of bizarrely for a trade magazine, uh, my area, which involves, involved bookstores, book distribution, and book wholesaling, was considered too boring and too trade oriented uh, for the new focus. So uh, in the next wave of corporate layoffs, I was shown the door. Um, happily for me, uh, during PW's short-lived attempt to try to be a consumer magazine, they shut down PW Daily for booksellers, which gave me a great opening to found shelf awareness. Um, and, I, and luckily for me, I had a, I had a good friend uh, in the business, uh, Jen Risco, who had been a sales rep and uh, was, was looking for a new challenge. And so in, in 2005, 10 years ago this April, we founded the company as partners, and she's in charge of the sales and business side, and I'm in charge of the editorial side. Uh, and from the beginning, we published Shelf Awareness Pro, which is a free email newsletter, and I recommend you all sign up for it. You can't lose. <laughs> um, and it comes out every business day. It's geared to helping booksellers as well as librarians do their jobs better, and includes most of what we had in uh, PW Daily as well as more interviews. Uh, we have book reviews and more sort of general news of the day. And we, we have more than 30,000 subscribers. Most of them are in the business, uh, booksellers and librarians, but also publishers, agents, scouts, authors. And then we have a few just uh, civilians, which are kind of rabid book lovers. And then four years ago, we launched our other major product, Shelf Awareness for Readers, which is a twice a week email newsletter consists mainly of 25 book reviews a week. There's uh, some author interviews, book trivia. We have an essay at the beginning. And we now have more than 300,000 subscribers for that. And the bulk of them come from uh, our editions that are co-branded with independent bookstores. Uh, and they go out to their email lists. And the, the co-branded editions uh, have mainly our content in them. But they have the, you know, the, the bookstore's logo and our logo, and then they can uh, customize a, a few things. They can do their own introductory essay, and they can put their calendar of events in. So we have, currently we have about 90 of the, these co-branded partnerships, and it keeps increasing uh, every week. Um, and the reader's newsletter is also free, both to the bookstores and their customers. And booksellers like it because uh, they don't have to do the work of putting out a newsletter. I mean, they have enough to do. And they sell a lot of books because of it. Um, we can't quantify the sales, but uh, booksellers say a lot of customers come in asking for you know, the books that were reviewed in your shelf awareness. And um, 
There's also buy buttons next to all the book reviews that go to the bookstore's website, the page for that book. So somebody can hit a buy button. We don't know if they actually buy a book, they go, but they do go to the website and they may buy a book. And then a lot of the bookstores have displays of the shelf awareness titles that are either adver or both advertised and uh, reviewed in each issue. And most of our revenue comes from advertising, which is mainly from publishers who want to reach, in one case, bookseller, booksellers and librarians, and in the other case, to reach uh, consumers. And uh, things have gone really well. Uh, so we now have um, a dozen full-time people, a bunch of freelancers, and about 50 reviewers who do anywhere from like one review a month to, with a couple workhorses who do a couple reviews a week. Um, so um, I have to say, getting fired was probably the best thing that ever happened to me professionally. <laughs> of course, I didn't feel that way at the time, but um, I'm very happy that it happened. Um, so on to the show. Um, at this point, the US book business, I think, is marked by trends that are remarkably contradictory. Parts of the business are consolidating as, as never before, while at the same part time, other parts are becoming more and more decentralized. For example, it's easier to publish than ever, but sometimes it's harder than ever to reach the average reader. Uh, the book market is more diffuse than ever, with the books in e and print format being sold online and in an amazing array of places, from traditional bookstores to big box retailers to places like Urban Outfitters, Williams Sonoma, Restoration Hardware. Uh, books are sidelines in a lot of these stores, and conversely, many bookstores offer sidelines such as uh, book-related items like stationery, journals, and bookmarks. But to, to kind of emphasize how everything keeps shifting and, and products get mixed, uh, I know from our holiday surveys in, in December and early January that some of the most popular sidelines in several really nice independent bookstores this season were socks and bras, of all things. <laughs> <laughs> There are also a lot of hybrid bookstores. Um, one new trend is the bar and bookstore, which I heartily approve of. Uh, and um, among my favorite hybrid uh, bookstores are a hair salon bookstore in Texas and a high-end bookstore car wash in Los Angeles. <laughs> At the same time, there's consolidation in book selling. Amazon sells as much as 70% of all eBooks and is the single largest seller of print books, accounting for anywhere from 30 to 40% of uh, sales at the average publisher, and I'll talk more about book selling in a few minutes. Uh, in publishing, the prime example of consolidation is Penguin Random House, which was formed uh, in 2013 in a merger of Penguin Group and Random House. A, l a lot of people wished it would have been called Random Penguin. <laughs> <laughs> the new house, uh, has op which has operations around the globe, uh, is larger in the U.S. than the next four U.S. houses combined. So that's larger than Simon & Schuster, HarperCollins, Macmillan, and Hachette together. Um, and off the record, uh, it, it seems that the Penguin Random House combination isn't really so much a merger as a, a, a slow, careful takeover uh, by Random House of Penguin. And it's probably being done this way because of, uh, to avoid anti-monopoly objections, which probably would have been really strong in Europe. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if in a year or two, Bertelsmann, which is Random House's owner, buys the part, the 47 percent of the company that's owned by Penguin's parent company, which is Pearson in the UK. So, oh, and another another note, uh, the, it's kind of interesting. The the big five U.S. publishers, uh, most of them are foreign owned. Penguin Random House is owned by Bertelsmann in Germany and Pearson in the UK. Uh, Macmillan, which includes uh, some pretty nice uh, houses, Henry Holt, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and St. Martin's Press, is owned by von Holtzbrink Publishing Group in Germany. Hachette Group, which includes Little Brown and Grand Central, is owned by Hachette in France. And then the remaining two big publishers have U.S. corporate owners. Uh, HarperCollins is part of Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, and Simon & Schuster is owned by CBS uh, which is better known, its, its old name was Viacom, it's essentially Viacom. Uh, and in the case of News Corp and CBS, the book operations, even though they're huge by book industry standards, are a, kind of a small part of the overall corporation. 
So the concentration of traditional publishing makes many people in the industry nervous. Uh, in the case of Penguin Random House, so far there hasn't been much of a disruption or abrupt change. Uh, and earlier this month, the company announced it's closing Penguin's Gotham and Hudson Street imprints, but it is expanding several other Penguin imprints. And the company keep, seems to be continuing the Random House tradition of being a confederation of publishers so that different imprints will uh, bid against each other for authors, uh, which is not always the case at different big houses. Um, and, and a lot of observers see the merged company as the best way for mainstream publishers to uh, counteract the power of Amazon. And I'll talk more about Amazon in a moment. Um, in wholesaling and distribution, there's similar consolidation. Uh, when I started covering book wholesaling, there were a couple dozen regional wholesalers. Now there's two national book wholesalers and just a handful of uh, regional ones. And distribution companies have similarly uh, consolidated. Um, and as for publishers, as recently as 10 years ago, there were no viable ebook plat platforms for self publishers, and book printing was an expensive, often unwieldy process. And once published, there were limited ways to market books. But now tens of thousands of self published authors and many small presses have found it remarkably easy to publish uh, ebooks or um, printed books courtesy of uh, print on demand. So, um, and you can see here, there's, there's a lot of, an example of some of the, a lot of fine new small presses that have popped up uh, in the last few years. So in late 2013, Bowker, which is the ISBN agency for the US, said that based on ISBNs registered, some uh, almost 400,000 new self-published books were published in 2012, up 59% over the previous year, and up 422% from 2007. And those numbers have likely gone even higher. And sometimes these days, it seems like there are more people in the US writing and publishing books than there are reading books. <laughs> um, and it used to be that the, the most effective way to reach readers was via reviews and other stories in newspapers, national news magazines, and specialty, ma specialty magazines. But much of that broad but not deep network is gone. Uh, most newspapers don't review books anymore. Um, or, or don't really have, they don't have review sections and they might have an occasional book review, but nothing like what they used to have. And Time and Newsweek, which were like really, like 20, 30 years ago, were just really crucial areas to have books reviewed. You know, they're just almost irrelevant now. Um, and of course, the internet has allowed indie publishers to reach readers in very focused, segmented ways. Uh, it's social media and bloggers and online interest groups have become incredibly important uh, in this fragmented book selling and publishing world. Um, a few self-published books have done really well, and some, some uh, self-published authors have, uh, you've, they say that they have this kind of success that they, they could never have had otherwise um, because of the new uh, digital world. Um, and most major publishers are starting to pay attention to self-published authors, and they're considering them a, another source of talent. Uh, and like for example, Penguin bought Author Source, and HarperCollins Christian Group has a whole big self-publishing component. Um, but many self-published books t uh, appeared uh, tend to appear in digital form, which kind of limits their uh, acceptance throughout the industry. Um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, and Ingram all have programs that cater to self-publishers. And there's a range of companies that have been formed in this area that promise all kinds of uh, editing, marketing, publicity support. Uh, and it's been a boon for some writers, but as I said, but um, the quality of self-published books is, is really ranges across the board. And some, some of them are really excellent, you know, but a lot of them are, are pretty crappy. <laughs> um, the biggest current news, I think, in publishing is that after several years of phenomenal growth, ebook sales have been leveling off in the U.S. Um, when, kin when Amazon launched the Kindle in 2007, for several years, ebook sales, uh, as measured by the Association of American Publishers, grew at triple-digit rates. Uh, it was normal for ebook sales to go up 100% or 200% and even 300% over similar periods uh, the year before. And some, some people, some pundits in the industry were predicting that 
print books would disappear as early as a couple of years ago, and some were saying by 2015. Um, and they, I don't know why, but they were all taken very seriously, even though they had uh, been doing this a couple other times in the past. Some had predicted a digital tsunami as early as the mid-1990s when CD-ROMs were a big fad. Uh, and then in the early 2000s when uh, the Rocket eBook and some other early but unsuccessful e-readers were introduced. So in any case, uh, last, uh, two, in 2013, the phenomenal growth of e-books leveled off. And for the full year uh, 2013, e-book sales rose only 3.8%, uh, which is obviously very modest compared to uh, what had been happening the, the previous few years. And then through October of 2014, which is the, the most recent period that I have statistics for, trade ebook sales were up 5.3%, but that's kind of in the same range as um, trade paperbacks, which were up 7.2%, a little more, and trade hardcovers, which were up 1.1%, obviously a little bit low, lower. So the, Ebooks have, you know, sort of become the kind of settled into a pattern similar to other book formats. Um, and there's a growing consensus that several factors are contributing to the leveling off of ebook sales. And for one, it, it seems that a lot, of, a significant number of many readers who tried ebooks are returning to print books after finding the experience kind of lacking. Um, and, I th and there's, in addition, I think um, many readers are now reading some books digitally and some books in print, and they often buy printed and digital copies of the same title and read one in the print book at home and the digital one while commuting or traveling. Um, sometimes they prefer to read certain kinds of books digitally. Uh, fiction is incredibly popular in digital form. And at, uh, two weeks ago, I was at the Digital Book World Conference in New York, and one of the speakers said that uh, was talking about fiction and how, import how important an ebook category that was. And he said that romance and erotica account for 50% of ebook fiction sales. <laughs> <laughs> the romance part I can understand because uh, romance fans have always traditionally read a huge amounts of books, and so digital makes sense. And for erotica, well, you know, nobody can see the covers of the erotica ebooks. So. <laughs> um, at the same, and consumers seem to be preferring print um, in the case of uh, nonfiction in general. Publishers have found they don't sell as many uh, nonfiction ebooks as uh, fiction. Uh, coffee table books obviously make a lot of sense as print and don't make much sense as you can't put, I don't know what you would put on a coffee table, uh, <laughs> your, your reader. And children's titles are also, uh, there's some growth in ebook sales of children's titles, but for the most part, they've stayed print. Um, and one, one reason is a, a lot of adults have found that it's a little hard to cuddle up on a, with a kid and read to the kid from a, you know, a, a tablet or a computer. Um, and the other major reason, growth, uh, reason for the slowing of growth in uh, e-books probably has to do with the widespread use of tablets like iPads rather than dedicated e-readers. Um, I, I keep hearing the same story from friends and others uh, that there are too many distractions on tablets for people who try to read books on them. So I know some people who commute uh, regularly, they used, to, they used to spend their time reading e-books e on their Nooks and Kindles, and now they have tablets and they're watching movies instead. Um, and also a lot of us work on screens all day, and paper is just a relief. And I, I know in my case, I can't read e-books. I tried, to, I read two e-books. There's a, I, I'm always on working on screens, editing and writing, and there's a part of my brain I could not turn off reading e-books, and it only turns off when I read paper. Um, so anyway, so as I, as I was saying, it seems that e-books are turning into uh, one of several formats for books alongside print, audio, large print, and so forth. Uh, and they, they're a significant part of the market. They're like 20, 25 percent of the average publishers sales, but they don't longer seem to be the wave of the future sweeping away print books. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, book retailing is becoming more fractured than ever outside of Amazon. Um, borders closed three and a half years ago, leaving Barnes & Noble as the only national uh, book selling chain. 
um, many people in the industry worry about Barnes & Noble, which has been closing more stores than opening them. Uh, but its traditional book retailing business is reasonably healthy. Uh, in 2009, BNN introduced the Nook, which was a strong competitor to the original Kindle e-reader. And at, at the time, a lot of people thought BNN should um, focus on digital books and shut down its traditional stores. Because the, the wisdom at the time was there was no future for print books and no future for bookstores. But with the shift to tablets, the Nook hasn't been able to compete. And now the same people are saying BNN should spin off its Nook operations and concentrate on its traditional business. <laughs> so a major concern for all publishers, from the smallest self-publishers to Penguin Random House, is what a lot of people call discoverability. Um, how does the average reader find out and learn about new books? Uh, online retailers are great if you know exactly what you want to buy, but they're not a good place to find books. Uh, and studies show again and again that the most effective place to learn about books is in bookstores, where readers can see, touch, and browse actual books, and they can talk to real live people. Um, the only problem is in the U.S., even, even though indies are growing again, there's less shelf space devoted to books than, the, than uh, going back several decades. And that's partly because of borders closing and BNN trimming back a bit and um, general retailers not selling as many books as they used to. Uh, online efforts to improve discoverability haven't uh, done very well. Amazon spent a fortune on algorithms to address the problem, but they're not very effective. There's several online book community group sites uh, or book-oriented social media sites uh, have grown up, and the you know, best known is Goodreads, I think. Um, and that was expanding rapidly and, and embraced by many people in the industry and especially independent booksellers until 2013 when Amazon bought it. So now it's kind of shunned by publishers and, uh, and independent booksellers. Uh, three of the major US publishers teamed up several years ago and founded Bookish, which was supposed to be a book discovery site that would rival Amazon. And that, it, there was a lot of delays. It finally launched in 2013 and was just kind of a big flop. And a year ago, the publishers gave up and sold it. Um, some publishers have had more luck reaching readers online through bloggers and, and fan sites. And it's especially true for genre fiction, uh, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, romance, science fiction and fantasy, mystery, and anything with a very specific subject area. So like a publisher with a book on the American Civil War might market the book in part through Civil War bloggers and amateur historian sites and, and other places devoted to the topic. Um, in the past year, more publishers have tried even harder to reach consumers directly, which is kind of goes against uh, the grain in the business. Um, HarperCollins and Simon and Schuster have set up several programs and websites that try to cultivate uh, consumer readership, and they offer books for sale. Um, these these things are probably being done. Uh, as a foil to Amazon, but there's a lot of concern among traditional booksellers, uh, Indies and Barnes and Noble, that the sites are way too competitive, that they're going around some of their, the pub publishers are going around some of their best customers, uh, i.e. the bookstores. And in the past, the booksellers didn't mind the publishers set it, selling online if they stuck to their list prices, but these new ventures are discounting books in a big way. So I want, so I want to talk a little bit about Amazon. Um, which is the one exception to the trend of a diffusion of outlets uh, in, the book, in book retailing. Um, it's odd to remember that Amazon began 20 years ago as an online retailer of printed books and nothing else. Now, of course, it's an $89 billion company selling just about anything you can imagine to customers across the globe. Uh, on Thursday, the company re released results for the fourth quarter of 2014 and the full year. Um, and this is sort of a typical Amazon story. The, the quarterly results were greeted warmly on Wall Street and the stock went up, I don't know, I don't remember now, but it was like 20% maybe. But the reason was, well, net income fell, but it didn't fall as much as Wall Street had predicted. So, um, 
there's striking, and there's some striking things that are going on with Amazon. Um, they had sales of nearly 89 billion last year, but still had a net loss of 241 million. Um, they keep, keep spending on a whole range of really expensive things, networks of warehouses across the globe, uh, expensive Hollywood programming, a failed new phone, <laughs> and it, it rarely makes money. Um, and also its rate of growth is slowing, uh, which is not a good thing on Wall Street. Uh, last year sales rose 19.5%, which sounds good, but at, at Amazon it used to, it wasn't that long ago, where sales would rise 25, 30, 40% a year. And also really significantly, uh, sales in the, the media category, which is where they uh, include books as well as music and movies, they were down 4% in the fourth quarter. Um, and what's, what's happened with Amazon is the Wall Street have, uh, has allowed the company to break all kinds of rule, rules that they apply to most other businesses, um, particularly about earning money. And <laughs> two years ago, I really love this quote, two years ago, Matthew Iglesias wrote in Slate uh, that Amazon is a charitable organization being run by elements of the investment community for the benefit of consumers. <laughs> so, so and now and nowadays books are just a tiny sliver of Amazon business. I mean, it's less than one percent. And uh, on Thursday, when they released their huge, they, their results, they had this huge, typically huge, long release about all the stuff they had done in the year and uh, what they were predicting. And they didn't mention books once. Um, but it's still the single largest retailer of books in the U.S. and it's become a huge presence. In other, um, in all the English-speaking countries around the world, and it's uh, getting stronger in a lot of other countries, particularly Germany, France, and I mean they're opening. They've opened in China, just opened in India. Um, so, uh, although many readers and uh, some smaller publishers are supporters of Amazon, most of the people in the industry loathe the company, <laughs> and that's because although they've done a lot of brilliant and pioneering things. Uh, the company conducts business and deals with much of the rest of the book industry in kind of aggressive, uh, misleading, underhanded ways. <laughs> I mean, one example is for years Amazon fought uh, collecting sales tax uh, um, tooth and nail, so that gave it a price advantage over all of bricks and mortar stores. And it argued that it, you know this is the most one of the most sophisticated um, tech companies in the world. They they couldn't figure out sales tax zip code by zip code. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they also argued that they were in favor of a national solution, knowing full well that there, no law could get through Congress, uh, <laughs> so addressing the issue. Um, but in large part through the efforts of the American Booksellers Association and other groups and, and states who are desperate to, to receive taxes, um, Amazon now collects sales tax in about half the U.S. states. Um, in some cases, it's a, it's a calculated business decision by Amazon because they want to open warehouses in those states uh, to offer faster delivery. So, but astoundingly, Amazon with a, it has a market capitalization of $160 billion, often gets tax breaks and other financial incentives to open warehouses and to start collecting sales tax. Um, uh, Amazon's relationship with many publishers might be described as a once wild love affair that's kind of uh, matured and gone sour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and while Amazon's the single largest customer for almost every publisher, large or small, um, it continues to be an aggressive competitor and a brutal negotiator over terms. Um, when wanting more advantageous sales terms uh, from publishers, Amazon has threatens and in some cases has gone through uh, delisting publishers' titles from its uh, site. Um, I'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. Um, there was a, a, a sort of an appalling quote in um, the Everything Store, Jeff Bezos and the Age of Amazon by Brad Stone, in which he uh, Stone quoted um, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos a few years back, telling his staff to pursue negotiations with the smallest book publishers like a cheetah would pursue a sickly gazelle. <laughs> and he, he wanted to call the project a gazelle, the gazelle project, but even Amazon lawyers thought that was a little too over the top. So. <laughs> um, 
Amazon's own publishing program has done well in genre categories and self-publishing, but not in its most ambitious endeavor, which was to create a New York office and uh, compete with the big five publishers for major books and authors. Um, it, it turned out that um, no indies or BNN would stock Amazon titles, or would, with a few tiny exceptions, and um, and even general retailers didn't want to stock Amazon stuff because it's gotten so competitive with them as well. And also, Amazon kind of missed a crucial thing, which was that author, big authors still like to go into bookstores and see their books on shelves. Um, Amazon was the, the main beneficiary of the Justice Department's 2012 suit against Apple and what were then five of the big six uh, publishers over, was over collusion involving uh, the agency model for ebooks. Um, and I think the Justice Department technically had a, had a solid case, but it was kind of narrowly focused and, and the punishment, um, which removed the agency model for a while, led to kind of drastic price cuts on ebooks, which just reinforced Amazon's uh, monopoly of 70% of the market. And uh, I don't know, the Justice Department seems to interpret monopoly law, these, or antitrust law these days, as, as a thing to reduce prices for consumers uh, more than anything else. And, and it kind of ignored the, it, it, well, it did ignore that Amazon has become a monopoly itself. And then obviously a major issue last year was the Amazon's battle, very public battle with Hachette, um, which all, all had to do with new terms for selling ebooks. And no one really knows the specifics, but whatever Amazon was asking for was, was bad enough for Hachette to just refuse, uh, even though it knew what was going to happen and that would be kind of banned from Amazon for, for months on end. So Amazon typically quietly made a bunch of changes to Hachette book listings, making it impossible to order books um, before pub date, which is really important to publishers so they can gauge uh, how a book's going to do. Um, they, they didn't stock a lot of Hachette titles, so they were listed as having you know two to four uh, week delay in delivery time, which is kind of a kiss of death uh, for any books on Amazon. And it, it also recommended other publishers' titles when customers sought Hachette titles, which is pretty amazing. Um, and in contrast, and it's very interesting because in, in contrast to some other public uh, fracases involving um, Amazon, such as similar kind of battle with Macmillan in 2010, this time Amazon got a lot of uh, bad publicity for its treatment of Hachette. Um, this kind of informal alliance of major publishers, writers from Hachette and other houses, in indie bookstores, chain bookstores, all kind of formed in, a, in opposition to Amazon t tactics. But it was kind of a weird um, amalgamation. Uh, one odd aspect was indie booksellers were supporting authors who were complaining that their sales of books on Amazon had dropped because of Amazon policies. <laughs> um, and, 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 uh, Amazon's major supporters were consumers who care more about price than what they see as kind of a greedy <coughs> book publishing world. And um, the other major supporters were self-published, uh, many self-published authors who have benefited from, from Amazon's uh, pro publishing programs. But, and this is sort of typical of Amazon, in a kind of ironic twist, last year, some of those self-published authors were upset when Amazon introduced Kindle Unlimited which allows customers to pay $9.99 a month to read as much as what they want of more than 600,000 ebooks, which include a lot of self-published works. So that's led to some major declines in income for some self-published authors. Um, now I want to talk about uh, independent booksellers, uh, some of my favorite people in the business. Um, you've probably all heard uh, bad news about traditional books, bricks and mortar bookselling. Um, although it's changing a little, uh, much of the general media narrative is stuck on several things that are either not the whole story or out of date. Um, major elements of that view focus on the borders collapse uh, three and a half years ago, fears of something similar happening at Barnes and Noble, digital books and Amazon taking over the book world, ebooks replacing printed books completely, and as a result, all bricks and mortar stores closing. So. Indies have had a rough time for the last several decades. Um, 
in the late 80s and 90s, a wave of chain superstores, Borders and Barnes and Noble, op uh, swept over the country. Then, and that resulted in a lot of independent bookstore closings. Then in the mid 90s, Amazon started selling printed books online. And then, of course, eight years ago, Amazon and others began selling e-readers and e-books. And that those two also led to um, independent bookstore closing. But indie booksellers, the last couple of years, are actually back and doing pretty well. Um, sales at most of them are up. Uh, many stores had their best year ever last year and their best holiday season ever this past December. Um, the, the American Booksellers Association said sales at average indie stores um, in 2014 were up 6% and December sales were up 9%. And this is a huge change from as recently as three or four years ago when, uh, when, when we were talking to booksellers, they would often say, oh, flat's the new up or down slightly is the new up. Um, a lot of indies are opening branches uh, and new stores are popping up again at a healthy rate. At Shelf Awareness, we now uh, have at least several stories a week about new stores opening. And not long ago, that was incredibly rare. Um, established stores with owners who want to retire uh, are no longer closing. Instead, they're buying buyers. Um, and after a long period of decline, membership in the ABA has increased the last several years from a low of about know, 1,500 to over 2,000. Um, and indie bookstores still represent less than 10% of the market, um, but publishers have begun to value them a lot more than they did uh, even as recently as four or five years ago, um, in large part because indie booksellers are, are real tastemakers uh, for books. And they also treat publishers much better than Amazon does. Um, indie booksellers can find and make books in ways that most other uh, book re retailers can't. I mean, Online booksellers, they don't really make books. Uh, and few associates at Target or Walmart or Costco uh, hand sell books, even if they know what books they have in stock. Uh, authors have similarly come to value indies more, uh, which was especially noticeable and, and picked up speed during the, the big Amazon Hachette battle last year. Um, and Sherman Alexi uh, started this Indies First initiative, which encourages authors to work in indie bookstores on the Saturday after Thanksgiving. And that's just taken off. It's like one of the biggest things in indie book selling uh, now. Uh, indies have also benefited from buy local movements, which have been particularly strong in uh, Austin, Texas, Salt Lake City, Asheville, probably Portland. For <laughs> it seems up. Uh, seems like it would fit here, too. Um, uh, on the national level, the ABA has supported a lot of bio local efforts and worked with other uh, national groups to promote the importance of local businesses and communities. Um, be, it, but still, being a successful bookseller these days takes a lot of work, smarts, and flexibility. Uh, the best ones I know around the country are constantly changing how they do business, whether it's um, adding products changing inventory mix, adding programs, opening and closing stores. They're constantly experimenting to see what works in a changing marketplace. Um, Powell's Books is an example of this. I mean, they just did this huge expensive remodeling of the front part of the store last year, which I think looks fantastic now. Um, and they're doing a lot of back office stuff that people wouldn't notice, but uh, is making uh, the store a much better place than it has been. Um, some indies have branched into publishing, they've done joint ventures, they're doing more and more off-site events, um, and they're partnering with, with schools, nonprofits, religious groups, other community groups. They're donating to charities, they do book reviews for local media. Um, there's been a significant um, increase in their visibility, and that's helped sell more books. Um, and obviously, author events are ever more important as a way to distinguish indies from other book retailers. Um, and they've been more and more creative about uh, events. We have stories regularly about uh, such bookseller, bookstore events as um, book lovers trips around the country and abroad, uh, speed dating evenings, trivia game nights, groups for teens, um, the list goes on and on. Uh, 
many indies have also expanded beyond selling just new books. Uh, they're stocking used books, which is more prevalent on the West Coast and obviously in Portland, but is sort of a new thing on the East Coast. Um, and of course, a lot have cafes or cafes next door. Um, a few indies have also installed espresso book machines. Uh, and Powell's does that. Um, so that's resulted in a lot more business for uh, local authors. Um, and there's a lot, a lot of them have developed programs to help authors publish books. Uh, so lastly, I want to talk about, or I was asked to talk about, and I want to talk about the uh, book business and writing as a career. Um, I've spent most of my adult life in the book business and seen it change a lot. Um, for the most part, I've, I've always loved it, um, even when things got kind of difficult. And I do remember when the financial crisis hit in, in 2008, uh, which was when ebooks and Amazon seemed to be taking over the world. Um, and it was common to hear a lot of people my age say that they were happy they only had like five or ten years until retirement because <laughs> 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 they wouldn't want to go into the business now. Um, but things have settled down somewhat, as I talked about earlier, uh, and I haven't heard that kind of talk in a while. Um, I have to say, for me, one of the, one of the best things about the business is uh, you work with, you tend to meet people and work with people who are really smart, they're knowledgeable, they're well-read, um, and, and they're eccentric, which is usually pretty good, um, entertaining at times. Um, but it's a big difference from a lot of other industries. Um, I mean, it's also a fascinating business, I think, it, because it's where culture and commerce overlap. Uh, you know, it's like for publishers and booksellers, to be able to create books, you have to sell books. And you can't just love literature, you also have to be able to promote it and sell it. So that it make, creates a kind of really interesting um, tension in the business. Uh, and despite, or because of all the change and turmoil that periodically hits the business, there are always new opportunities. And I think Shelf Awareness is a great example of that. And then on the, on the writing side, I think getting published is often, a, a, feels like a crapshoot. I was talking about this earlier at the panel I was on, so I apologize if you've heard this earlier, but I live in, in a town in New Jersey near New York City. It's full of artists, publishers, media people, including Stephen Colbert, uh, and a lot of writers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it must have been Colbert, the Colbert mentioned. Uh, <laughs> but uh, among the writers, there's like this full range of experiences. Um, I know, most of them are really talented, they're good writers, they've been plugging away for years. Some of them have never been able to publish a book. Um, I know some who've published novels and memoirs and they've sold okay, but not, a, but not at levels that made it easy for them to continue publishing books. But then on the other hand, there's several people who, I, I don't, they don't seem any different from those people and they've done really well, although it's been in kind of unexpected ways. Um, I have one friend who has a women's magazine uh, writing background and she wrote a series of what she readily calls chiclet novels, kind of fluff, and they've sold decently. And then she decided to write a serious literary novel, something she'd been wanting to do for a long time. So this was going to be a big break for her. And it did get published, sank without a trace. Um, but, and she wasn't very happy, of course. But then one of the chiclet books got sold to Hollywood. It's being made into a TV series. And now she's moving to, she's moved to Hollywood. She's working on scripts. And she's just like ecstatic and really happy about it. Then I had another friend who published several kind of serious relationship novels. And they sold enough so that they can, you know, that she continued to be published. And then her latest book, she added this historical element um, to the relationship book. And this is um, Orphan Train, uh, Christina Baker Klein. And that book became this amazing bestseller. It's like all these reading groups are reading it. It's, she now, you know, she's just a totally different kind of writer career. Before it was like, you know, what's your name again? And now it's like, oh, it's Christina Baker Klein. Um, and also, I want to say that another aspect of getting published is that 
once you get published, it's not sort of a magical, easy ending. In a lot of cases, when you get published is when the hard work starts. And it's not always a financial blessing. Uh, the digital book world did a survey of authors and found that a third of them earn less than $500 a year. <laughs> so as for getting published, it feels like lightning can strike, um, but you don't know where. And so for those of you who are writers, I'd say keep plugging away, stay focused, learn to get satisfaction from your writing, even if it's not immediately published, and keep your day job. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh,